I'm using Bridge to view the lesson folder for Chapter 5. This chapter is comprised of a variety of shorter lessons. I will go through each of these lessons highlighting the areas that I feel are most important. In some instances, I will elaborate beyond the lesson in the book, especially where it is applicable to your first project. The first section starts with correcting red eye, so I'll double click on the red eye start JPEG to open it in Photoshop. The first thing I'm going to do is save a working file of this. I'm using the keyboard shortcut Command Shift S to bring up the Save As dialog box. That would be a Control Shift S on a PC instead of a Mac. So I'm going to rename this from Start to Working and then change the format to Photoshop and just save it right back in the same lesson folder. Now we can see up here in the tab that this has changed. It's not the original document we opened, it's a new one. Now the book doesn't have you create a new layer to edit and I think that's kind of a mistake because if we followed the book we would be doing what's called a destructive edit. And I always like to make a copy of my original layer before doing destructive edits so that I can return at any time to something that I might have messed up or easily see a before and after of what I've accomplished. So I usually start by selecting the layer and dragging it to the page icon right here, which creates a second layer. We can see that it says background copy. I'll collapse this so we can see it a little bit better. And then I'm in the habit of double clicking on this and renaming it to my retouch layer. Red eye is really easy to fix in Photoshop and you find the red eye removal tool under the spot healing brush. So if you click and hold, you'll see red eye at the bottom. Now the book gives you some very specific settings to dial in here. It says 23% for the pupil size and 62% for the darken amount. You can play around with these and see if you get a different outcome. I'm going to zoom in here on the eyes so we can see what's happening. Get zoomed in really close so we can see it well. Now all you have to do is click in the center of the red area of the eye and instantly it changes to a neutral color. I'll do a command zero or a control zero to fit this in window. And now you can see because I created a, a separate retouch layer that I can do a before and after by just clicking on the visibility eyeball icon here to turn this on and off and we can see how well that worked. Now we're going to brighten the image using a curves adjustment layer. We did this in the second chapter of the book. I'm going to open the adjustments panel here and click on the curves adjustment layer to add a curve layer above. And my, my screen dimensions are pretty low here, so we're having a hard time viewing all of it. Let me double click on that so we can see this better. I'm trying to show you both the layers and the properties. Now the book has you click on the auto button. The auto algorithms built into Photoshop for both curves and levels do a pretty good job. And when I clicked on auto, we can see that that did a nice job of brightening her face. If I turn the visibility on and off of that adjustment layer, you'll see the change. Take a look at how the curve is bent up. It basically is brightening the middle values of the image. Now we'll reset it with this reset button down here below output. And then take a look at some of the presets that are here. I need to scroll up to see the presets. If I click here where it says default, there's a bunch of presets. If I pick lighter, it's going to lighten the image in a similar way that auto did, but it's not exactly the same. If you use a preset, it's going to apply the same exact edit regardless of what the image looks like. But if you use auto, it's going to take into consideration what the image looks like and try and correct it accordingly. So it's kind of a good idea to always start with the auto button and see where you go from there. The top icon here is called the on image adjustment tool. It's very handy when you're trying to brighten or darken an image using curves. I'm going to reset this to explain how that works and select this tool. And notice this circle on the curve as I hover over my image. What that's doing is targeting the range of the curve that of the pixels that are under the eyedropper. So right now I'm right about in the mid values of the image. 
but if I hover my cursor over the dark area of her hair, we'll see that circle on the curve drop down to the lower left corner, which represents the black. If I hover over the white back here, we'll see that the circle is way up in the right, represents the white areas of the image. So I want to target the mid values. I'll click here on her forehead. As soon as I click, it puts a point down on the curve, and then I'll just scroll up like a light switch. I'm just shifting this up, and it pulls the curve up, brightening the image. It's really important to understand the difference of working in an RGB document versus a CMYK. The book has you follow an RGB image. I've converted this to CMYK. If we look up here in the tab, it now says CMYK. And I deleted the curves layer that was there. I'm going to add a new curves layer, and we'll see how differently this works when you're in a CMYK document. I'll click the Auto button. And we can see that it made auto adjustments. It kind of balanced the color tones. It didn't brighten it that much. And we can see that it moved the different channels independently. I'll reset this and then go to the preset defaults and pick lighter. And it, it did brighten the image overall. But take a look at the curve. The curve went down instead of up. So CMYK works the opposite in brightening to darkening. To brighten a CMYK document, you need to pull the curve down. And to darken it, you pull the curve up. Now we're at the section in the book, um, Adjusting Facial Features with Liquify. I've returned my document to the RGB color mode because the Liquify filter works best in RGB. I've opened the Liquify panel by going to Filter Liquify as outlined in the book. I suggest that you spend some time just playing with the options here. The book has you dial in some specific values in the Properties panel here on the right. But if you choose this Face tool right here and then hover over the image, these handles will pop up in the different facial regions. For example, here I can take this eye and I could open it or close it. I can hover over the nose, and I can make her nose longer or shorter. And what's really fun is the mouth here. I can open her mouth. I can puff up her lips. And this rotated line here on the side will turn the corners up so we can give her a smile. I can change the entire shape of her face by just clicking here, making it narrower, pulling her chin down a little bit, pulling her forehead up. So play around with these tools. They're a lot of fun. You can actually create something pretty cartoonish if you take it too far, but it's fun. I'm going to say OK. And then because I created this separate retouch layer, I can turn it on and off, and we can see where this image started and where we ended with. I've opened the egret end file instead of starting from the start file for this blur gallery lesson. The blur gallery is a lot of fun and we'll get into some of the um, features inside of it. But first I wanted to talk about this smart object layer. The book has you convert the layer to a smart object so that you could apply a non-destructive smart filter. If I turn the visibility on and off on this filter, we'll see the blur go away. And then if I turn it on, the blur comes back. What's happening is I like to describe a smart object as a safe deposit box for your pixels. So once you convert a pixel layer to a smart object, you're protecting all of those pixels. And you can't hurt those pixels with a blur or a filter because the pixels are inside of the, sa the smart object. The only way to get inside of the smart object is to double click on the layer. If I double click right here on this layer, it opens the original pixels. And we can see a tab up here. It's actually the start file. I could actually damage these pixels directly by, say, painting on it with red. And then when I close out of this and choose to save it, the um, edit that I made is reflected back in this smart object. And that would be a destructive edit. But any filters that I apply to this smart object are non-destructive because we can turn them on and off. 
So I'm going to undo that by just going to my history panel and going back to the start here. And then we'll take a look at how the um, blur gallery works. If I double click on the name blur gallery, it'll take me into the blur gallery. So let's take a closer look of how this effect is done. We have several blur tools. This one that's um, has been applied already is the iris blur. And we can see that it's on because it has a check next to it. It's kind of hard to see this blur because it's pretty subtle at six pixels. So I'm going to crank it way up so that we can see what's happening here. If I click on this center point, I can center where the blur is. So I can move this around. I can actually control the blur amount with this. So notice as I drag on this radius here that the blur number of um, right now it's at 43 pixels. So that changes as I drag this around. I can make the blur radius larger by just clicking on the edge and dragging in or out. If I hold my shift key down when I do that, it'll lock it into a perfect circle. If I don't want a perfect circle, I need to um, grab one of these four pins. Let's pull this to the center here. I need to click on one of these four pins, right on that pin and then pull it out and that'll turn it into an oval. And then when I have an oval, I can rotate the oval. Notice that my cursor icon looks like the rotated arrows as I hover over this area. So that'll let me rotate it. Now these pins inside of here contain the feather of the blur. So as I pull these towards the um, circle, it gets really sharp or where it drops off from the blur to the sharp is kind of a really hard edge. But as I pull this in, it feathers it in more um, subtly. If I want to move these independently, I need to hold down my Option key or the Alt key on the PC. And then let's do this one down here. We'll see it better. I can move this one separate from these. So you have a lot of control if you play around with these um, features in here. I'm going to reposition this back so that we can see the egret and focus. And then click the OK button up here at the top so that we can return to the regular workspace and see how that blur affected the smart object here. I'm going to go beyond the chapter lesson right now and talk a little bit more about smart objects because this is going to be applicable to your project. I'm going to place an image into this document and this is probably how you're going to place images into your project one document. I'm going to go to place embedded and we'll go ahead and place the working file that we just worked on for the red eye lesson. And that creates a new layer here. If I want to commit the position of that, I'll just click the big check here at the top. Take a close look at the layer panel. It has the same icon in the lower red, right hand side or right hand corner of this that the egret does. It shows that it's a smart object. So. Every time you place an image into a document, it's placed as a smart object. And that means that all the information that was in that file is contained inside of this. Now, this was a layered working Photoshop file. Right now we see it as just a single layer. But if I double click on this layer, it'll open that working document that I created with my retouch layer and my curves layer. If I made an edit here, Say I come to my curves and I make it even, well, let's see, that made it contrasty. Let's open this up and pull this up, make it a lot brighter. And then close this out and save it. We'll see that edit reflected here back in the egret file. Now, because this is a smart object, I can apply filters to it non-destructively, just like I've done to the egret. In fact, you can drag a smart filter from one layer. I'll take this and just drag it up to the red eye working layer. And now the blur that was applied to the egret is now being applied to the portrait. We can see it's not really in the best position, but you can see how this works. I'm going to do a command Z to undo that. If I hold my option key or my alt key down when I drag it, 
it will make a copy. Notice the two arrows next to each other. So I'll drag that up and let go. And if I click here in the right hand side, it'll open that up so we can see there's a smart filter applied. So the egret behind still has the smart filter blur and the portrait with the red eye lesson has the same filter applied. If I double click here on blur gallery, it'll open the blur gallery and I could reposition this for her and say OK. And so now the blur on the red eye layer is in the correct position, but the blur on the egret layer stays in the position it was originally.